Welcome to this video tutorial where I'll be showing you my character illustration process in Clip Studio Paint. Along this tutorial, I'll be sharing valuable tips as well as explaining my thought processes in creating this piece. There are four main phases in my workflow. Concept, structure, lighting and color, and polishing. Suffice to say, concept art is a very broad topic, and I can't and won't tackle it in depth in this tutorial. However, I will assume that you already have a concept in mind, and I might go over my process in depth in a future video. With Clipped Studio Paint's powerful posing and 3D tools, you can create almost any pose you'd like. The main advantage of creating this pose mannequin is that you get to see that the pose works in different angles. Not to mention, you get to control the focal length of your camera, control how dynamic or dramatic you'd like your angle to be. Once I got the pose I wanted, I set it to a very low opacity, and I create a draft layer. It can easily be done by using one of the macros that already comes with Clip. I then start drawing the rough sketch to finalize the forms of my character, making each stroke purposefully. At this point, I can afford to keep the sketch not as clean as possible since I'm creating this sketch for myself, but I also try to strike a balance between the line quality and speed. The clearer the sketch is to me and the more it makes sense, the easier it will be for me later on. A few disclaimers. 1. This is my current process and it's by no means the most efficient or the most proper way to work. I do think that the tools I've learned to use have been most helpful to me, and I hope they can help you too, no matter what your skill level may be. Bonus tip. It really helps to master the canvas manipulation methods in Clip Studio Paint to get the strokes just right. In the course of the tutorial, you'll see me zooming in and out and rotating the canvas very often. You can use Control Space to zoom in and out, and Shift Space to rotate the canvas. Here I must apologize however. My recording at some point during this phase was lost and I ended up with <laughs> the already finished sketch. Basically, I just went through the entire posed mannequin and inserted all the details I wanted in the forms of my character. Bonus tip. I flip my canvas from time to time to check for anything I missed. It has the effect of giving you a fresh perspective on your work. After the sketching part, I start to lay down the final line art. Now, here's a really neat feature Clip Studio Paint has to offer. Vector Layers The strokes you create in a vector layer are much more flexible than normal raster layers, as you'll see shortly.
Using vector erase, you can easily remove strokes that intersect. Doing clean overlapping line art has never been this easy. I've never seen anything outside of Clip Studio Paint that makes it as easy as this. Moving along, I continue to lay down my strokes with little regard to the intersections thanks to the vector layers vector erase feature. Another thing that makes vector layers super handy for people who need clean line art are the vector correct line set of tools. These tools allow you to change the thickness of your stroke even after you've already made them. Line thickness is very useful in insinuating depth even without texture or lighting just through overlapping thick over thin lines. Another handy thing about vector layer strokes is that they can individually be manipulated. Pressing control and tapping on the vector stroke will let you edit the stroke or any of its control points. You can also simplify the stroke to reduce the number of control points, making the stroke a lot smoother and manageable to manipulate. This is handy for those long rounded strokes that could take a lot of repetitions to perfect. These tools are by no means substitute for fundamental line work skill, but it does make it a whole lot easier and faster for intermediate illustrators and painters to create clean line work. By the time we're in the coloring and lighting phase, we'll be thanking ourselves for creating this clean line art. Doing the flats has never been easy with the fill tool. Using it in conjunction with the reference layer tool and our clean line art layer. I first make my clean line art layer as my reference layer as indicated by the lighthouse and create a flat color layer below it. I create as many layers as needed in a logical fashion. Clothes over skin, accessories over clothes, so on and so forth. Each flat will have their own separate layer. You'll be thanking yourself later when you do this, as it saves a lot of time the lighting and painting phase. If the fill tool doesn't do the job properly, you can always use the paint unfilled areas tool to tidy things up really quickly. This is especially useful when there are holes in the flats that need coloring. If I ever find myself encountering a problem at this stage, I tend to clean things up at the line art level and fix all the kinks on the flats level as well. It's very easy to do this at this point since there are only a handful of active layers.
Another general but important tip is to clean as you go. You sometimes see stuff that you know that could cause problems later on, or things that don't really look right. Clean it up when you can, because experience has always taught me that you can't catch all these things, and even more so if you leave them up for later. As we're done with all the flats, so too we leave the structure phase. Now comes the lighting phase. The colors are already in place. So we first establish the overall mood of the scene by changing the background. Once I've decided on the final background, or at least the mood I'm after, I click on the layer I want to paint over and use Clip Studio Paint's helpful macros to create a clipping folder for each of the flats. This will ensure whatever I paint on the clipping layers will only affect the flats non-destructively. Lighting is one of the most important aspects in illustration. You can express it in many ways. It can be expressed through line shadow, hatching, masses of black, gray, or white. From a technical standpoint, lighting will define how the character sits in the physical plane, what texture the materials are, how the forms of the objects will feel. From a creative standpoint, lighting will be used to convey the mood, atmosphere, and tell your story. As artists, it's our job to balance and use light effectively to our advantage, while keeping the piece interesting and our audience engaged. Not to mention, make the piece read well. Let's talk about shadows. Shadows only exist when there is a light source. Light and shadow when used effectively, can clearly define the shape of an object and its volume. Right now, I am working in passes, slowly but surely, putting in the most significant shadows first. I'm going from the most prominent shapes to the more nuanced. There are different kinds of shadows. When light hits objects at an angle, grazing the object, the form of the object itself causes parts of the object to be in shadow. These are called form shadows because it's the form of the object that causes them to appear. Most form shadows are soft, but this is not always true. Different surfaces have different form shadows. And then there are cast shadows. As the name implies, cast shadows are cast from one object obstructing the light from another object. Therefore, almost always creates a harsh, hard shadow on top of that object. This isn't always the case, however. How harsh the shadow is will vary depending on how large the light source and how far it is from the object in question. With the shadows all in one layer, it's easy to go in and modify them with the same brush, adding and subtracting as I go. If you press C in brush mode, this will cause your brush to become a deductive brush instead of additive. It beats going to eraser mode as it copies the blending option of the brush itself and leaves your brushwork fairly intact. 
Not to mention it's very intuitive to add and subtract masses of shadow. There will be parts that will have darker shadow. Where the light almost never reaches. These parts are sometimes called occluded areas. Where elements or objects sit fairly close to each other. These areas receive the least amount of light. Therefore, they're the darkest. After painting the shadow parts, I start to paint the highlights and lighting effects in a dif from different sources on a different layer. I could easily paint them on the shadow layer or have them simply on the base layer. But I find that painting the light separately allows me some more flexibility later on as painting the lights in another layer lets me change the color of the lights easily. When the layer stack gets out of hand, I find that using control plus shift plus tapping can easily point me to the layer group I want to affect. This makes painting and working with layers fairly manageable. This is a helpful tip. Using a black field layer and using the color blending mode, then toggling the layer on and off, I can check the values I've painted. Colors can sometimes be misleading. Different saturations, temperatures, relative perception can get in the way. Toggling this layer on and off will only let you see the values in grayscale. If you haven't noticed, I haven't painted her eyes yet. This is mainly because realistically, the eyes are not white or of a higher value compared to the surrounding face or skin. I choose to paint the eyes as I'm painting the light because the eyes are a bit glossy and they reflect light differently compared to the skin. However, their values are not really higher than the skin itself. Again, I course correct as I go. I tend 
to keep looking at the piece from afar, and zooming in, fixing what I need to fix. Checking the values, I group the entire character into a folder. Then I create a layer on top, clip it down, and paint on it, setting the blending to multiply. Grouping the entire character and creating a layer on top of it makes implementing sweeping changes a lot easier. I am fairly satisfied with the character right now, so we'll be moving to the background. Using the concept in my mind as a guide, as well as looking at some of the creative forest shots taken at night, I use some flora brushes that I've downloaded from another user to create the background and foreground for this piece. If you're interested in the flora brushes, links in the description. I won't be going in depth in how I created the background since the main focus of the piece is the character. As long as the character sits on the background snugly and is well composed into the scene, I'm happy. The purpose of this piece is not the concept of the Feywild or some forest. It's about the character who's using her magic as a source of light as she goes about finding her way in the forest. So I place little emphasis on the background. I use correction layers to composite the character as best as I can with the background. Adding in some atmospheric perspective with a soft airbrush. From time to time, I reuse that black layer I created earlier to check my values, course correcting whatever I see fit. I have to make sure that the character sits in the background convincingly. And what better way to do that but to add contact shadows and cast shadows on where she's stepping on. Not to mention changing some of the colors on her as well. There's a balance to keep. We need contrast from her in the background, but she shouldn't stand out as if she doesn't belong there. At about the 25 minute point of this video, I think I, can, I could have called it a day and kept the line art at the bottom without adding any more polish to the piece, but that just didn't sit well with me and I decided to move some of the line art and applied some blending modes to them. I then selectively removed some of the line art here and there, non-destructively of course. Then I create a layer, normal blending mode, where I manually use the paintbrush. Alt-clicking to color pick 
and go in and paint what I want to manually change. This gives me 100% control over the final value and color of the strokes I place on the piece. I consider this the start of the polishing phase. I can try and fix everything the way I want it to appear in the final shot in this phase. This phase can take as long as a third of the entire time I take to finish this piece, but sometimes less. This is an oddly satisfying phase for me in my workflow, and I'm convinced it can really help the piece sometimes, but sometimes it breaks it as well. At this point, I can also create new layers and experiment with new things. Sometimes in other pieces, I even add in some jewelry and accessories if the client deems necessary, albeit cumbersome. If you've been illustrating or painting for as long as others have, I do think that some of the prior steps before this can be skipped, and you can just paint directly. But going through the steps that we went through can help you find your style when you're just starting out. And sometimes it just provides more clarity on which aspect you need to improve on.
So here's the part where I add that spell circle effect. Clip Studio has some tools to create very useful shapes like circles and other polygons. I use the circle tool to draw a variety of circles. You can choose them from the drop down. After laying in a variety of circles, clicking and dragging to determine the size first, then clicking and dragging to determine the rotation, I then place a symmetrical ruler with six sides. Design-wise, I wanted the shape to be somewhat organic, but magical as well. And that huge outer circle just didn't look organic or ornate enough for me, so I clipped some parts of it off. Then I transform the selection by pressing Ctrl T. I then Ctrl click and drag the corners of the handles to manipulate the perspective of the magic circle. Placing it as how I somewhat imagined in the original concept. Now to create the magical glow effect, I simply duplicated that shape, changed the blending mode to add glow, filter blurred it, and then repeat the process a couple of times. I repeat this until I think I've got the desired effect. And that's it for the circle. So that has been my entire process. I hope you've learned something. Or at the very least, I hope even just one of the tips I flashed had been helpful. Got feedback or questions? I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for watching.